It's difficult to believe today that once upon a time Adolf Hitler's idol was Benito Mussolini, but in the almost two decades before World War II disabused him of any such sentiments, Hitler saw in the Italian dictator the roadmap to his own successful grab for power in Germany. In 1922, Mussolini and his fascist followers had famously marched on Rome and toppled the elected government, the king appointing the former army corporal and former left-wing journalist leader of Italy. A year later, the former army corporal Adolf Hitler would stage a bold bid for power in Bavaria by attempting to bypass the democratic process and simply seize power for himself by force. Today is the 100th anniversary of the so-called Beer Hall Putsch, but unlike Mussolini, Hitler's revolution would fail, and it would take him another decade before he managed to gain power in Germany. The Nazi Party had emerged out of the political turmoil of post-World War I Germany, where politics had become polarised between the hard left, who had even briefly succeeded in setting up some communist-inspired governments across Germany, notably in Bavaria, and the far right, principally represented by the various paramilitary Freikorps units of disgruntled ex-imperial army soldiers, who helped the weak central government to crush these nascent communist enclaves. Hitler was a low-ranking, though highly decorated World War I soldier who had stayed in the army after Germany's defeat and was sent to spy on a tiny right-wing political party that lurked in Munich beer halls, called the DAP, the German Workers' Party. On the 12th of September 1919, Hitler, in broad agreement with the party's platform, joined it and soon became its most charismatic speaker. He eventually became its leader, changing its name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party in an effort to win over those on the moderate left. And it also spawned his own private army, the Sturm Abteilung, the SA, known commonly as the Brown Shirts. In 1920, Hitler had very clearly set out the aims of his organisation, the so-called 25 Points his party platform promising revenge on those they felt had betrayed Germany by surrendering in 1918, and to tear up the humiliating Treaty of Versailles, and to start sorting out the economic and employment problems that beset post-World War I Germany. And, of course, he promised a showdown with the Jews, whom Hitler held to be behind these problems and in control of the Weimar government, and he also believed them to be part of a larger worldwide conspiracy. Hitler promised to prevent a communist takeover in Germany that would ultimately hurt the middle and upper classes and to preserve the laws of private property and business interests. And Hitler promised territorial expansion, not only the reconquest of those parts of Germany forfeited as part of the post-World War I peace settlement, but to conquer more territory besides, territory he termed colonies. The Nazis were noted for their violent political meetings and for Hitler's strong leadership that drew in many other disaffected political groupings, including patriotic organisations and other Freikorps units, until by 1923 Hitler had effective leadership over several, known collectively as the Kampfbund, or Battle League. Hitler had no time for the democratic process, and taking Mussolini's successful march on Rome as his inspiration, planned to use his powerful political base in Bavaria, backed by his private army of 15,000 brown shirts, to firstly seize power in Munich, and then use this as a springboard for a march on Berlin, to seize the leadership of the nation from what the Nazis and the right saw as the corrupt and weak Weimar government. Beer halls had featured prominently in Hitler's rise to prominence, large indoor social gathering halls where Hitler's oratorical powers had been given full reign, and it was at a famous Munich beer hall that the coup or putsch would begin. Munich in 1923 was in a state of turmoil between left and right, and on the 26th of September, Bavarian Prime Minister Eugen von Knilling had declared a state of emergency. Gustav Ritter von Kahr was appointed state commissioner and given emergency powers to govern Bavaria alongside two other men, Bavarian police chief Colonel Hans Ritter von Zeiser and Reichswehr general Otto von Losel, who commanded all the army forces in Bavaria, all aristocrats and presumably on the political right. Hitler judged that the moment was right to begin his revolution. 
he announced to von Kahr that the Nazis and their Kampfbund friends would hold 16 mass meetings throughout Munich the following day, 27th of September. Kahr decided to ban the meetings, putting the ball into Hitler's court. If he accepted the ban, he would appear weak. So would he now act and defy von Kahr's orders? Hitler had the support of famous World War I general Erich Ludendorff, who was widely respected by army, state and general public, and he tried to use Ludendorff to win over Kahr and his commission to Hitler's way of thinking. That was a coup in Munich and a march on Berlin. Incredibly, Kahr was actually plotting a coup of his own with Seizer and Lozol to make himself dictator of Bavaria. Hitler realized that Kahr was trying to control him and he was not willing to act against the central government in Berlin. Therefore, Hitler decided, under these circumstances, to go it alone, using his brown shirts. On the evening of the 8th of November 1923, von Kahr was delivering a speech at the Berger Breukeller, a large beer hall crammed with 3,000 people. Hitler ordered 603 brown shirts, all heavily armed, to surround the building, and then Hitler, at the head of two dozen or so Nazi leaders that included Hermann Göring, marched inside. The crowd was extremely noisy, so Hitler jumped onto a chair and fired his pistol into the ceiling, shouting, The national revolution has broken out. The hall is surrounded by 600 men. Nobody is allowed to leave. Hitler told the surprised audience that the government was overthrown, and along with General Ludendorff, Hitler was forming a new Bavarian government. Kahr, Seizer, and Lozo were taken into a side room. There, Hitler demanded that they support the coup and accept positions in his new government, but Kahr said he couldn't cooperate, as he was being compelled to do so at gunpoint, which was true. The Nazis now sent out for General Ludendorff to help back their case, Hitler's heavy artillery. Captain Ernst Röhm, leader of the Imperial War Flag Group that included Heinrich Himmler amongst its senior members, was at the Löwenbräukeller, another beer hall. By telephone, Röhm was ordered to begin to deploy his men and capture key locations throughout Munich. Other conspirators tried to co-op cadets at the city's infantry officers' school to help take over the city. Hitler now addressed the 3,000-member audience at the Berger Breukeller and managed to win them over to his ideas within a few minutes, the crowd vocally supporting Hitler and the coup. Ludendorff turned up and stood with Hitler, completing the image, and the crowd was dispersed. Hitler left to deal with another matter, and Ludendorff at this point stupidly released von Kahr and his associates, having extracted their verbal support for the coup, who immediately began to take measures against Hitler. Another of the Kampfbund organizations loyal to Hitler, Bund Oberland, led by Max Ritter von Müller, was dispatched to take small arms from the army engineer barracks, but here an army captain and 400 of his men locked themselves inside the building and refused to join the coup. All throughout the night of the 8th to 9th of November, Nazi and Kampfbund officials were active throughout Munich, attempting to capture certain buildings, but resistance was encountered. Reichswehr troops opened fire on Ernst Röhm's men, and reinforcements began to arrive in the city. Hitler knew that his putsch had effectively failed by mid-morning on the 9th of November. Morale among the Nazis was waning fast, but it was General Ludendorff who suggested that in one final grand gesture they march. To where, precisely, no one quite knew at the time, but in a visible and defiant gesture designed to engender local support among the citizens of Munich. Hitler set off at the head of a column of 2,000 or so men towards the city centre. Beginning at the Berger Breukeller on Rosenheimstrasse, the column crossed the Ludwigsbrücke, a double bridge across the river Isar into central Munich. Here, Hitler and his marchers faced the first Bavarian police cordon, consisting of 30 men armed with rifles and a single machine gun. They had strict orders not to let the putschists cross. As the column approached the police, Hermann Göring, World War I fighter ace and highly decorated war hero, shouted at the police, imploring them not to fire on fellow World War I veterans, their comrades. 
In a few confused moments, Hitler's bodyguard unit managed to disarm the police, beating some of them up, and the column passed across the bridge. Marching down Zweibrücke Strasse, the column now entered Munich Old Town via the massive Isertor gates, passing under its 40-meter-tall tower. The column marched along Taul Street towards the Marienplatz. Reaching the city square, Nazi leader Julius Streicher made an impassioned speech, trying to win over members of the public to join the march. Hitler remained strangely silent, refusing to speak. But many of the crowd did indeed join the march, swelling its numbers. Moving on, the column continued along the narrow Weinstrasse, lined with shops reaching Max Josef Platz, which contains the National Theatre. Onwards, the crowd lurched through narrow Residenzstrasse, forcing the column to march only a dozen abreast as the road was so narrow. Hitler at the front, alongside his bodyguard, Ulrich Graf, Hermann Göring and General Ludendorff. The problem was that although the column was up to 3,000 people strong by this stage, the narrow street meant that it could not manoeuvre. The Munich police had positioned 100 men to block access to the Audienzplatz, the big square beneath the Feldherrnhalle or Field Marshal's Hall, a large neoclassical memorial building to the Royal Bavarian Army. Here, shots rang out. Who first fired shots has never been established, but in the space of about 30 seconds, 14 Nazis were shot dead, along with four policemen. Göring and many others were shot and wounded, and chaos ensued. Ernst Röhm and part of the marching crowd, including Himmler, had been detached earlier to capture the War Ministry building in the city centre. But during the 9th of November, Bavarian troops arrived to place Röhm's men under siege. It is now believed that Ludendorff's suggestion of a march into the city centre was actually made with the objective of liberating his friend Rome and his men trapped at the war ministry. While the gun battle occurred at the Feldherrnhalle, Rome's men fought the army around the war ministry, losing two of their men killed before being surrounded and being forced to surrender. Though Hitler managed to escape from the Odeonsplatz, he was later arrested, and he and the Nazi leaders were placed on trial for treason and subsequently imprisoned. Following Hitler's release from prison, he dedicated himself to winning power in Germany via democratic means, but it was not until the 30th of January 1933, after several elections and some behind-the-scenes political shenanigans, that Hitler eventually became Chancellor of Germany those still in Germany that had stood against the 1923 revolution were punished. Ritter von Kahr had been forced to resign from his office in 1924, and he appeared as a prosecution witness at Hitler's treason trial. During the Night of the Long Knives, 30th of June 1934, when Hitler, at Himmler's urging, eradicated the main players who were not fully behind the new leader, Kahr was arrested at his Munich apartment by two SS men, who severely roughed him up on the journey to Dachau concentration camp. He was taken to a special building called the Bunker and summarily shot. His body, badly mutilated with pickaxes, was left dumped on Dachau Moor, and his murder declared a legal act. General von Losso, Kahr's accomplice in putting down the Beer Hall Putsch, escaped the Nazis' rage and died in Munich in 1938, aged 70. The third member of the Kahr Triumvirate, Police Chief Zeiser, retired in 1930. In 1933, he was arrested and sent to Dachau concentration camp, being released by US forces in 1945. He lived until 1973, dying at the age of 98. The Knight of the Long Knives' principal victim was Hitler's strongest supporter during the coup, Ernst Röhm. His vocal doubts about Hitler's leadership of the party and the immense power he wielded over a vast brown-shirt army witnessed himself and most of the SA leaders summarily arrested and liquidated in the SS-run operation. Röhm was shot to death in his prison cell after refusing to shoot himself. 
General Ludendorff, too, distanced himself from Hitler after the appointment of Hitler as Chancellor by his old World War I leader, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, in January 1933. Hindenburg was then President of Germany. Ludendorff allegedly wrote to Hindenburg the following, quote, I solemnly prophesy that this accursed man will cast our Reich into the abyss and bring our nation to inconceivable misery. Future generations will damn you in your grave for what you have done. End quote. Ludendorff refused Hitler's offer of promotion to field marshal and died in 1937, aged 72. Against his wishes, he was given a Nazi state funeral. And finally, the buildings associated with the Bierhul Putsch were elevated under Hitler's rule into being holy places, and the 14 Nazis who died to being holy martyrs. Every year in the lead-up to World War II would witness Hitler and the other senior Nazi veterans of the Putsch gather at the Berger Breukeller, where Hitler would speak, and then march the same route to the Audiensplatz as the Great Column in 1923. From there, they would complete their march to the location Hitler failed to reach in 1923, the Königsplatz, now turned into the heart of Nazi Munich, dominated by new buildings like the Führerbau and the twin Ehrentempel, or honor temples, where the 14 Nazi martyrs were entombed like pharaohs. At the spot where the coup had been stopped by rifle fire in 1923, a large Nazi memorial was created on the side of the Feldherrnhalle, being another form of remembrance. Munich was badly damaged by Allied bombing raids, and the buildings associated with the Putsch progressively altered or destroyed post-war. The Burger Breu Keller was damaged by bombing and restored and used by the U.S. occupation authorities until 1957. It then served as a beer hall once more, until torn down in 1979. The Nazi memorial beside the Feldherrnhalle was pulled down by locals in June 1945 and subsequently destroyed. The Ehren temples were emptied of their sarcophagi and then blown up. Their collapsed remains allowed to become overgrown with foliage in a symbolic act. All the remaining Nazi-era buildings in Munich have been repaired and repurposed, their origins not advertised or spoken of today. So ends the story of the Bierhul Putsch that took place 100 years ago today. Many thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.